All right, guys, thank you for coming tonight. Um, we're going to talk about surveillance. Is anybody here for the first presentation we did in 2014, my first give us? Cool. That's, that's awesome. That's what I want. I want. I'd rather talk to new people than the same people who. Have anybody before this heard anything about stingrays or aware of uh, what Houston's doing as far as surveillance? Yeah. I've read a little bit about it. It's basically the gist of it. I've seen drones and I've seen the Yeah, Houston, Houston is the fourth largest city, of course, so we have nearly every new surveillance tool that is being used by major police departments. It's, we're one of the pilot cities, New York City, LA, and Houston. So everything we're going to go over tonight, um, for the most part, it started with, for the most part, it started in the military. And now these tools have made their way to the streets of places like Houston and much smaller cities. You know, you've got little tiny towns in New Hampshire with what are called Bearcats, look like tanks. And, you know, this is just part of the militarization of the police. So we're going to focus particularly, though, on surveillance and more specifically on stingrays, cell site simulators, my computer's restarting right now. And also, I'm going to give you guys some information related to open records requests that I filed um, related to the Houston Police Department monitoring the Houston Freethinkers activist groups and also their use of stingrays <coughs> and I have some you know, interesting piece of information that I'll share with you guys related to that and then also new to this presentation since none of you guys were here last time that's good but I'm all, I've also added 16 more slides since the last presentation um, because there's just so much more information to add when I gave the presentation at the end of 2014, I had anticipated that 2015 was going to be a big year for uh, Stingray surveillance, and it was. There was you know, New York Times article with lots of mainstream press written about it, and tons of other activists, such as myself, filing open records requests and piece by piece finding out what we could about these devices. So we have a lot more information to, to share, and also, like I said, it relates to aerial surveillance. Somebody's flying surveillance planes over the city of Houston, and trying to find out, and I'd like help for whoever wants to work on that particular project, I'm going to present that to you guys too. Alright, let me open this up and we'll get started. Alright, <coughs> Has anybody ever had any weird stuff happen to their phone? What's <laughs> that? <laughs> Because I get people will ask me once I start giving presentations like this, oh, well, hey, my phone has done this, or my phone's done this. What is, is that a stingray? Could that be a stingray? Um, and it's hard to really say because, as I'm going to show you, a lot of this information has been kept secret from us. But the bits and pieces that we are finding out, you know, it, it does allow us to make an educated guess. Uh, if you have missed calls constantly, or if you're an activist, or, you know, say an organizer, or even if you just attend a protest at some point, and your phone starts acting funny. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're being targeted specifically, but the way that these devices work, they could just jam the signal of you know, different devices in range. So it, as silly as it sounds, and you know, if you're not really up to anything for the most part, there's really nothing to worry about. I mean, we've got tons of files here with my name and people's names in this room that they've been watching since 2010, but it's information that we put out there publicly. So you just kind of do it with the awareness that the police are always watching, unfortunately. That's, whether you're doing things legal, you know, or otherwise, they're, they're always watching. So let's get started. So this is a quote from Tim Clemente. He's a former FBI counterterrorism expert, and this is from an interview he did on CNN, May 1st, 2013. And he said, I'm talking about all digital communications. There's a way to look at digital communications in the past. And I can't go into how it's done or what's done, but I can tell you that no digital communication is secure. Since 9-11, um, many of you are probably familiar with the, as I was discussing, the militarization of the police. This is happening through the federal program 1033, whereby military equipment is being uh, sent to local police departments through Department of Homeland Security grants, funding from the federal government. And this is, as we've seen, an increase of this from the war on terror, post-9-11 world, um, heavily surveillance. And this fear of terrorism mainly has allowed for an invasion of our privacy and increased surveillance under the guise of safety. Some of the methods of surveillance that we are aware of include cell site simulators, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, automatic license plate readers, um, public audio recording devices, which are sometimes known as, uh, there's one called Spot Shotter, or 
uh, known as gunshot detectors, the theory being that if there's a crime and a gun goes off, it automatically records, and then they can you know, maybe find the criminal, but the problem is those devices are always recording. Um, so those are just some of the examples of various devices and some more we're going to get into tonight. So we're focusing on cell phones. As of 2013, a Pew Research study found that 90% of all adults in this country are using cell phones, so obviously cell phone monitoring affects everyone in this room. 91% of adults using cell phones. Now what we're focused on tonight is known as a cell site simulator, also known as a Stingray, it's also known as an IMSI catcher, International Mobile Subscriber Identity, which is the specific number that everyone's cell phone has. It's you know, it's unique to your number, to your phone, and basically it's a way to identify your phone beyond just the cell phone number. Um, what Stingray does, it pretends to be a cell phone tower. So every 10 to 12 seconds, your cell phone right now is sending out, and even a dumb phone like the one I have, they're all sending out signals and connecting to cell towers constantly. So a Stingray is what's known as a man, it does a man in the middle of that. It comes in between that, it masquerades itself as a cell tower, and tricks your phone into sending its data to it, so it connects to it, and then depending on the capabilities of the particular cell site simulator, they can take the contents of your conversation, pictures, text, your location, phone numbers, dial all that information. Um, yeah, and so that's that's the basis for what the cell site simulator does. And of course, it's it's pitched as catching criminals. You know, this is for it's supposed to be exclusively for criminal investigations, terrorism investigations. Um, in Houston, what we, what we know a little bit about the Houston uh, Department, there's a unit, a specific unit, that has six police officers, and if a police officer wants to use a Stingray, they do have to come to that unit and request, make a request for that. So, and we'll get more into that, I don't want to get ahead of myself as far as what they're doing in Houston, um, and the difference between that process and actual judicial review. <coughs> so this is a, kind of an example. You guys, have you seen that movie, um, Superbad, maybe it was? I don't know, there was some like, like <coughs> silly comedy movie, and in the movie they joke about triangulation. And I, I feel like a lot of people kind of think that that's sort of just like a Hollywood joke thing, but that triangulation is what they do with stingrays. It's you know, using the cell towers and using that IMSI or your cell phone number to locate you. The stingray can be, as you see right here, it can be a little hand, a, a little device. It's computer basically fits in a suitcase. It can also be a handheld device. So the police officer could have a computer sitting inside his van or his car. They've also now started to make um, wearable stingrays, basically, where the officer could just have it clipped on his belt and walking around all the time, and uh, nobody would have any idea. So in this example, you see the stingray is within the van. They're looking for a suspect. Uh, they know the IMSI number, or maybe they know the cell phone number, and they know he's at a festival. So they go to that festival, and they're pinging around trying to connect to that, that number. But in the process, it's not targeted. It's very indiscriminate. So everyone else, every other cell phone within range is also going to get its data scooped up. And uh, you know, that's where we start to get into the problems with these devices. So this technology has existed since at least the 1990s, and as I said, it was started with the military. Um, Stingrays first started to get reported, that name was first used in around 2011. There's a guy, the uh, history of how they were exposed is really interesting, I mean, we could talk about that a whole other time, but this guy, Daniel Rigmaiden, was basically, he was involved in a lot of fraud crimes and really seemed like an, an intelligent guy, at least he knew how to scam the system. When he got arrested, though, he started to try to figure out because he was super um, off the grid. He always protected himself and would just go out and do his little crimes and disappear. Eventually he got caught, of course, and he tried to figure out how did they find him. You know, he thought he took all these steps. He started doing research, and then in the process of doing this jailhouse research while he was finding his case, he started to see these, this self site simulator name, the Stingray name. And just from within the jail, he was able to do all this research and share it with the uh, digital privacy community. But it started with his case. And you know, that was kind of when we first started to discover a lot about this. They've been made since 2002 by the Harris Corporation, which is based out of Melbourne, Florida. Uh, there are other devices that are also self-site simulators, but do different things, operate a little differently. There's the Stingray 2, which is what Houston has, Amberjet, Kingfish, Triggerfish, Loggerhead, and Hailstorm. They use these aquatic and weather weird names a lot. I'm not sure. Um, 
So this was further exposed, the technology was further exposed in summer 2013 by Edward Snowden. Some of the documents he leaked were related to cell site simulator technology. And uh, it's, in, it's received increased attention 2014, 2015, as the courts are now basically trying to decide the legality of this. And that's the point we're at, we're at now where there's different cities, different states have different rulings. You know, one judge says they don't need a warrant, another judge says they do. You know, one judge says it's okay to secrecy, another judge says no, turn over these documents. So eventually it's probably going to make it to the Supreme Court at some point, and there will be a, you know, a decision made on that. And just as late as uh, December, there was a whistleblower who released the manuals to these, doc to these uh, devices, so that was really cool. Um, it's the first time that we were actually able to see, because I'm about to show you guys how secretive they are about this and how you know, everything I'm telling you has been pieced together by just researching from other, there's a guy in Chicago, there's another activist in Tucson, Arizona, there's one in Florida, there's me out here, and there's one in Minnesota that I know are actively filing open records requests and just putting the pieces together and whistleblowers and such. So we're really having to do a lot of work because they're not offering us much information about how these devices work. And, um, you know, on that note, sometimes we get people who, who will say, well, Maybe there's a legitimate reason the police have a reason to be secret about this. For instance, when I filed the open records request, some of the, the uh, objections were that they have ongoing investigations and if they reveal how the devices work, then it's going to help give the criminals the advantage, you know, how to fight them or how to avoid them. And, uh, and like I said, maybe that argument could be made, but I feel like the secrecy that we're about to go through is unwarranted and us as people here in the city, it's, it's, up, it's our job to, you know, to demand this information. Um, I've questioned the chief of police twice on this now, and both times he's told me that he couldn't confirm or deny it while I could literally have the copies of the city council record purchases. You know, he's, I can't confirm or deny that we have these things. And to me, that's a lie. I, I don't really know how else to look at it other than a lie whenever we both know it's a lie. You know, even if, but the problem is they've signed these non-disclosure agreements that we're going to get into now. Um, so, the cell site simulators, as I said, for the most part, they don't require a warrant. There was, there hasn't been any really major rulings, so some cities are going with it. For the most part, the cops are just getting away with whatever they can at this point. You know, it's really, and if we're not asking the questions, they're not gonna, there's not really an internal review process, and we just have to trust that they're using it in the right way, but the problem is that we haven't even known about them until we see this cop, this guy here, he's good. <laughs> yeah, it's a cat. You can't see. <laughs> um, so, so the Harris Court. Now, this is really where it gets really fuzzy and weird. I didn't when I was starting to research this. It just blew my mind. And I still last night was on Greenwatch talking to a lawyer. And he's like, he's just asking me, how is this? How how can they do that? You know. So Her the Harris Corporation manufactures the devices. Um, Boeing, several other companies also make them, but Harris Court is the biggest company that does these. They partnered with the FBI and required any law enforcement agencies that want to use the devices to sign non-disclosure agreements saying that they won't re release any manuals, they won't reveal how the devices work, or any details about what type of information is collected, how long it's collected, who has access to that information, anything that you, know, you would like to know. Um, and this has been challenged in court several times, which is really just mind-blowing to see a case in Baltimore, right? So they tell us on one hand they need these devices, they need to take their tax dollars and use them to buy these devices so that they can catch bad criminals. You know, and, and they've also said, you know, a kidnapping, for instance, right? You know, maybe we know where the kidnapper's at, we need to go use the stinger real quick. They, they always try to throw out these really extreme examples of what, to justify this technology, which aren't really, the, when you start to look at all the cases, they're all drug cases, really small, petty, nonviolent things that they're using to catch people in. And the problem is because there's so much secrecy, there's probably thousands of people that have been convicted for crimes, and the, and the uh, evidence was probably illegally gained using stingrays, but the people had no idea that they were ever used. And judges probably approved that because when they bring us to a judge and they say, judge, we want to get this device, they usually do a pen register, a trap and trace order, which is old school NSA stuff, mainly for landlines. You know, all that does is gives you the number going in and the number going out. That's all it's supposed to do. They're not supposed to get any more information than that. So when they go there with the judge, say we want to get a pen register, a trap and trace order for this surveillance equipment. That's all they say. They don't explain to the judge the full capacity of these devices and what they're capable. And so there's a judge, uh, Brian Owsley, he's uh, out of Corpus Christi. He was one of the first people to really fight this, uh, this, this technology when he found out about it and then he realized that he'd approved it hundreds of times without 
you know, ever knowing what he was approving, he wrote letters to judges all around the country, basically asking, have you heard of this? Have you seen this technology? And so he's been really instrumental in getting the judicial branch to actually pay attention to what's going on. What's your name? Um, his name is Judge Brian Owsley, Corpus Christi. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so that's related to the non-disclosure agreements. And what I was saying is about Baltimore, there was actually cases where they're in trial, you know, and they have one of them, you know, it's really unfortunate because one of them I did see was a rape case. And they, I guess they gathered the data or they found the guy using a stingray. But now, because of all the secrecy, that case might get thrown out because you know they tried to hide the fact that they're using the stingray. So now people who are legitimately probably should be locked up, you know, uh, it's just it's causing a lot of issues with the trial. But there was one case where it was a drug charge, and the the officer was on the stand, on the witness stand, and the judge asked him to describe how they used the stingray, how they went about catching the guy, and he said, uh, "I'm sorry, I can't give you that information. You know, I, my non-disclosure agreement doesn't allow you to." To know about this, and the judge is like, "Well, I don't. I didn't sign a non-disclosure agreement. You, know, you need to." And they basically chose to withdraw the case and drop the charges rather than talk about it. And that's happened several times around the country, where they're rather than discuss how they're being used, they're like, "Okay, never mind. We'll just let the person off." This supposedly, you know, dangerous person that they need to use the equipment for in the first place. Um, and I mentioned it's indiscriminate surveillance. Also, I've been able to document that uh, the Harris Corporation they lied to the FCC. They lied to the FCC whenever they applied for their um, their permit because anytime you're interfering with cell waves, cell tower waves, you have to go through FCC Federal Communications something or other. Um, basically, just another bureaucracy that handles that. And so the F the Harris Court had to go to them and get approval to use this device. But in that in their permit, they basically said that the device isn't capable of messing with you know, cell lines. They lied about what its full capacity was to do, and they said that it would only be used in emergency instances, which, as I said, the abundance of use. Um, one department used it over 3,000 times within a year period. So they're obviously using it more than just emergencies. Uh, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation called Stingrays an unconstitutional all-you-can-eat data buffet. <laughs> now these next ones are just some articles to show you the examples of what I'm talking about here as far as um, the secrecy. This is from just last week in Phoenix. Judge says no need for police to explain cell phone tracking. In a unanimous decision, the judges rejected the arguments by the American Civil Liberties Union that the public has a right to the information related to the stingrays. They said that it would, quote, not be in the interest of the state. So, I mean, that right there shows you where who they're defending. It's, it's not in the interest of the state to release this information. And this ruling specifically involves efforts by a freelance reporter represented by the ACLU to expose not only the workings of a device owned by the Tucson Police Department, but how it can identify cell phones of others who are not suspects in criminal cases. So that's one of them, right there, them saying that the public doesn't have a right to know how that's working. And here's another one. This is in Sacramento. Sacramento Sheriff's Department in court last week admitted that the man who heads up their Stingray Department admitted that he and his team members never told judges or prosecutors that they were using the so-called cell site simulators, nor did they specifically ask for permission to use one. I mean, this is just last week, so this news information is coming all the time, and I just try to keep a, you know awareness of all the different cases. Um, Lieutenant Dan Morrissey testified in the case brought by the Sacramento Public uh, Defender's Office. He said that prosecutors and judges were not on the list of people who he has been allowed to talk to about Stingray. His, his specific um, statement says, I don't think that's the way the FBI wrote the non-disclosure agreement. I think it was that you had to be a sworn peace officer. So telling the judge, sorry, you're not on my list. I can't talk to you about it. Um, and this is one that went the opposite direction. This is in Chicago. This is actually a recent victory. Uh, Chicago judge is basically forcing the cops to release the information. It's not public yet, but what she's uh, doing, this is a Chicago activist, for, activist, Freddie Martinez. He's doing the same thing, working with the ACO out there. Filed open records request, the cops deny it, and you have to sue them basically to get anything out of them. So it, it went to court, and this judge said they have to provide her all the documents related to how the Stingray devices work in Chicago, how the CPD has been using it. She's going to review it, and on the 25th of this month, which is next Tuesday, I think, or next Monday, she's going to decide whether or not that information will be made public or if the cops have a right to keep it secret. So that's, you know, any day now we might have more information about how these work. But this is just an example of how you know how the law, the law is treating these in different cities. A little bit more details now. As long as your phone is on, the Stingray can find you. Like I said earlier, it said uh, as long as you're putting out a signal, no matter how <coughs> powerful a phone or what encrypted type of communications you have, there's still a 
possibility for them to intercept your communications. You don't have to be making or receiving a call for your phone to be tracked. Now, if you've ever been in a situation, like I said earlier, a protest or some type of where there's police present and you know you see them with some weird equipment or your phone's acting up, one way that you could tell is if your phone if your phone dies quicker than it typically does, or if it's at full signal and it's not normally at full signal. Because what the Stingray does, so right here I have an old school phone. This is 3G, I guess. So what they would do is this would attach to this phone and it would downgrade it to 2G, which is totally unprotected and easy to, to crack into. So the newer phones, 4G, 4G LTE, those are those other devices I was telling you about. It's called the Hailstorm. That's the newer one. And I expect HPD is probably going to upgrade to that one soon. That specifically works on the new encrypted networks. And that's what it'll do is it attacks your phone, downgrades it to an unencrypted channel, and then gets what it needs to. Um, <clears throat> I've had a couple times doing research on the internet where uh, my phone will be like 85, 95 percent completely fine, and then within 20 minutes it's dropped down to like two, three percent, and it just dies on me. But yeah, at that's... the same time, like whenever that does happen, <clears throat> like my service just completely goes out. And then if I do end up having service to make a call, there's a little red light on the top of my phone that clicks on. And I've checked on multiple phone calls here and there, and there's it's only on certain times when I talk to certain people that it glows red. Yeah, you know, stuff like that, like, like I said earlier at the beginning, I'm hesitant, you know, to tell everyone who has weird phone things that somebody's monitoring you or this or that because, you know, we're all, we're all obviously not all up to anything that interesting, ultimately. But the, the point is to know that if these signs do happen, you know, like I said, if you're at a protest, a large protest, officers there more than likely are bringing these to protests. We've seen this happen in Chicago and Minnesota. Um, San Diego, and there's definitely been suspicion of it happening in Houston. And I will sometimes have weird things happen on my phone. The battery dying is one of the quickest signs to it, the, the full capacity of the phone, because it makes your phone work as hard as it can. Like it attaches to it, and it hit, makes your phone run at full speed while it takes everything from it. Could it attach to your, to your um, television and your computer? Um, Different kind of electronics? Um, I'm sure there's other devices that work on that. In the manual that I was talking about that got leaked, there's definitely uh, devices that are called jammers that can jam signals beyond just cell phones, pretty much any type of other, uh, any other, probably a TV. But main, I don't think the Stingray is operating on that same way. But yeah, there's probably other devices that could jam other types of signals. I mean, these are just floating around everywhere, so they uh, essentially say that you don't have a right to privacy to that information while it's floating between you, your phone and whoever it's going to. If they can grab it, that's fair game. Um, like I said, body-worn IMSI catchers are coming. That's something they're discussing now. And they're already being used on planes, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. So this technology has made it into the hands of, and this is from 2012. I'm sure there's a few more we've confirmed now. but. Safe to say at least 50 different local law enforcement agencies and 19 states around the country. And at least 12 federal agencies are known to use these devices. NSA, DEA, Marshall's Office, FBI, CIA, um, everyone, um, who else? Oh, the IRS is using them as well. I would find that out just what? a ago. Yeah, the, That's IRS, incredible. the IRS was revealed to happen just a couple months ago. Um, so this is a map right here. The blue color that you can see, the darker one, it's a little hard to distinguish on that screen, but mainly it's like the left, California, Arizona, uh, Alaska, Washington, Idaho, and Georgia, Missouri. That's where local police have cell site simulators. The red one, which is what Texas is, Texas, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, New York, Florida, state and local police have cell site simulators. Um, the little yellowish puke looking color, Indiana, or what's another I in? I don't know. Yeah, no, no, no. The other one was Idaho. Yeah, this is yeah. Yeah. Iowa, yeah, that's Indiana. Indiana and Pennsylvania state police have cell site simulators, and the rest of them are unknown uh, at this point. But I'm sure we can probably add a few. I'm looking at this list. Now, most of the places here have already been confirmed, but we can only expect that it's only a matter of time before the other police departments want the same tools. But they want to play with the same toys. Um, so this is related to the airplane program. So the Wall Street Journal was the first one to expose, it was related to the FBI. Um, and this is an article a couple weeks after they first revealed it when the U.S. Marshals were defending the program. It says a Justice Department official on Friday defended the legality of a program to scoop up data from thousands of mobile phones as a secret operation comes under scrutiny from lawmakers and caught the federal agency that regulates the nation's airways by surprise. 
um, devices on plane to look for criminals, but sift through other phones. The program doesn't track public says official. So that's their official stance on it. The ACLU responded with um, open records request, filing freedom of information act request, trying to find out because the first story was okay. The U.S. Marshals are using these planes. They're operating them, and uh, this is where it gets even cooler because it's, it's related to Houston. Then we found out that the FBI was also using. But the FBI, it wasn't just that the FBI is using these small Cessna planes, and um, so the Harris Court doesn't make the plane ones. When they're in the planes, they're usually made by another company that's called Digital Receiver Technology, or DRT. So people just refer to it as DRT or dirt boxes, like if they're in the plane, it's just called a dirt box. And it's just the same thing, it's a stingray, it's probably about the size of this, it goes in there. Sometimes they're attached to the bottom, <coughs> you see that little camera down at the bottom, there's some other, I'll show you a better picture. Um, it can gather up the, the information from 10,000 phones in a single flight. So it can fly over, say, a protest and just circle over. And this is how we started to find out about it because activists in Baltimore, after the Freddie Gray protests and riots, they started through Twitter. It was really awesome to see it happen. People were like, hey, there's planes circling overhead here. And this guy that I've ended up becoming friends with, he's out of Minnesota. He's got some basic aviation knowledge, and him and a couple other people just tracked the planes, used some websites, and were able to find out the companies that the planes are registered to, and find out that they're actually registered to fake front companies connected to the FBI, um, and they're running these surveillance flights. So this is from the article right here. It says, in a recent 30-day period, the agency, the FBI, flew more than 30, flew above more than 30 cities in 11 states across the country, and an Associated Press review found. Aerial surveillance represents a changing frontier for law enforcement, providing what the government maintains is an important tool in criminal. The program raises questions about whether there should be updated policies protecting civil liberties. U.S. law enforcement officials confirmed for the first time the wide-scale use of the aircraft, which the Associated Press traced to at least 13 fake companies such as FX, FVX Research, KQM Aviation, NBR Aviation, PXW Services, they're all really generic names like that. Um, even basic aspects of the program are being withheld from the public and censored versions of official report from the Justice Department's Inspector General. The FBI has also been careful not to reveal its surveillance flights and court documents. So that's when we first found out about last year. And then this is the guy I was talking about in Minnesota, Sam Richards from the North Star Post. Then he found out that the DEA also has them, the Drug Enforcement Agency is using these. Hey guys, my camera died right there, so I'm just going to continue the presentation right now. So the article says the DEA registered 30 aircraft of their fleet to a post office box in Houston, Texas, under the corporate name of Silver Creek Aviation Services, a company that does not exist beyond registering these aircraft. Another non-existent company used for the sake of registering aircraft is Lindsay Aviation Services, which houses an additional 10 surveillance aircraft. And as we just mentioned, this is the same tactic that the FBI used uh, for their surveillance fleet, and these are operating as you can see in this image with these cameras and more than likely uh, with Stingray surveillance DRT boxes within the airplanes. After it was revealed that surveillance planes are flying over Baltimore, the ACLU also filed Freedom of Information Act requests to the FAA trying to find out exactly what was going on and of course we have learned since then that more police departments are using surveillance planes, including DRT, Stingray surveillance boxes, over ma major ma metropolitan areas. And this includes uh, California, Anaheim. California was just revealed this week, so that's another police department. And this article here is also from the North Star Post. Sa says, cell phone surveillance used on Black Lives Matter protesters at the 4th Precinct in Minneapolis. And this is just, like I said, another example of these, these toys saying that they're going after um, you know, emergency situations where they have to, uh, you know, kidnapping or uh, dangerous criminals. That's the reasoning they often use to justify the use of these tools or the purchasing of these tools. But then they're being used more and more against innocent people or targeting activist type individuals. Now the next part we're going to focus on Houston under watch and look specifically about how these tools affect the Houston area. Houston began using the Stingray technology in 2007. City Council gave additional funding in 2011, and it was also reauthorized in 2012 with only one vote of no against it. Then recently they upgraded to the Stingray 2 to keep up with cellular networks. As I mentioned, the updated Stingrays and the hailstorms 
the newer models can actually attack the 4G LTE networks, the encrypted networks, to downgrade you to an unencrypted network. And this is what the Houston Police Department have. They have the Stingray 2s. And I plan to do more open records requests to find out what I can about their use of uh, Stingrays and if they have the Hailstorm and other more advanced technology. Now this was first acknowledged in September 2014. There was an article um, in truthout.org and then there was also Jace Larson, Channel 2 reporter, did a, a report on it and myself I've been asking the chief of police about this for a couple of years now. It became national news in November 2014. The HPD chief of police and several Harris County judges have refused to answer any questions regarding the use of them, although we absolutely have the, um, the, the contracts and the documents proving that they're using them. Whenever I ask the chief of police, and you can see the video of this on the Houston Freethinkers YouTube channel, when I asked the chief about the use of these tools, he, he laughed me off and said, you know, I don't know what you're looking at and tried to make me sound like I was crazy or some kind of conspiracy, you know, whatever, theorist. But what's interesting is in my open records request, the documents that I obtained from them, one of them is actually an email where the city council members and the chief of police and other uh, police officials are emailing back and forth trying to get on the same page about how to respond to Jace Larson and to you know, other individuals who are requesting information about how these tools work. And they also sent the exact article that I referenced to the chief when he said, oh, I don't know what you're reading. Um, and so I just thought that was interesting that they're, they're trying to laugh me off like I'm crazy for researching and, and using the information against them. And yet when I ask him uh, about the stingrays, he says, I can't confirm or deny this, although I'm sitting here looking at the documents myself. And in September 2014, a San Antonio judge ruled that no warrant was needed because you have no reasonable expectation of privacy with these uh, these signals flying in the air from your phone elsewhere. You have no reason to expect privacy, uh, according to this judge. This slide right here, you can see the actual uh, city council record right here. Delivery date 2012, $100,000 for a maintenance on the Stingray 2. Now, the Texas Civil Rights Project said in January 2014, we need to start a serious dialogue about the level of governmental intrusion in our daily lives that government foists upon us without our consent. This was following the installation of 180 new cameras in downtown Houston, which brought the number close to 1,000, and I think it's over 1,000 now since then. And this money is coming, of course, from the DHS funding from the federal government, uh, and it's in the name of fighting terrorism. I mentioned the flights earlier. We discuss surveillance flights. Now this, I'm going to show you images that haven't been seen before, and you can find these by using flight tracking websites and just looking over the Houston area. And if you look up some of these fake front companies we mentioned and search for their planes, you can find them operating in different major cities around the country. You just got to you do your research. But this one is from just a few days ago. It shows a plane on the west side of town flying near Katy, Cinco Ranch, Sugarland, Richmond area. Just straight line there and then back up. And this next one, though, is closer to the downtown area. This is actually close to my house. And uh, they just a few days ago, they drove past downtown, flew past downtown, and circled, 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 did some weird patterns over there for that area. For whatever reason, they're watching something right there. Um, and we don't know who's operating these flights. This could be the Houston Police Department. I do know they have an aerial surveillance division. Uh, this could be the FBI. FBI has a huge um, field office in Houston. It could be that DEA office that we just mentioned from the North Star Post report that's registered here to a P.O. box that does not, there's no actual business behind it. And I talked with Sam Richards of the North Star Post, and he says he believes that this tool right here, the Typhoon, is possibly the one that might be in the surveillance planes that we're seeing over the cities. Uh, it's sure to capture data from thousands of bystanders' phones. This is coming from the Intercept. The Intercept was leaked a manual of the Stingray, this Typhoon, Hailstorm, a number of other cell site simulator type tools, and they have released that to the public. And this is one of them, uh, the Typhoon. You can read the, the details here, but basically it's capable of gathering thousands of people's data over single flights and identifying them, adding them to watch lists, target watch lists, things like that. So that's an example of one tool they might be using. Now, the next couple of slides are going to focus on the Houston Freethinkers activist community that I was involved in starting in 2012. 
or 2010, excuse me. And this image you're seeing right here was sent to the Houston Freethinkers to in 2000, yeah, in 2012. So the group started in 2010, and spring of 2012, we were sent this image. Um, and what you can see there is on to the left, that black box is covering the face of an officer. To the right is another officer, um, and you can see his shirt. And in the background, you see the screen that says Houston Freethinkers, and that's a video from the airport that we had a few years ago. And this is taken by somebody who was within that classroom, which is pretty disturbing. And what are they doing in that classroom? Well, just a couple months before we were sent that image, we were sent these emails, and they were from a law enforcement officer in the Houston area who attended a training session. And he said, I've seen the intel they have on HFT, the Houston Freethinkers, very scary. You'd think they were a violent organization. I've been forced to watch videos they have on them, having to keep my mouth shut. I totally support HFT. I sent them an email trying to warn them of intel be being gathered on them, but never received a response. He says, it's been so long, I honestly don't remember exactly what I said. I created a freedom-related email named just to send them what I did and deleted it after never hearing back. There may very, they may very well be aware of what I told them, but if not, they need to know that we were shown videos in a class at HPD, HFT's own videos posted on YouTube. The instructor was able to name each and every leader of HFT. I felt HPD has a great disdain for their organization. It's hard to explain, and you'd have to have been there to sense the militarized tone of the instructor. Just wanted them to know, watch their backs, and wouldn't be surprised, although I have no knowledge of this whatsoever, that they could be infiltrated by undercover officers in an attempt to garner intel. Again, I really have no clue how far HPD takes that stuff. I observed this during a training session at HPD over a year ago, and subsequent training station se sessions have not, no mention of HFT. And please note, they were not the subject of the training. Don't pass my name along to them. If they are under surveillance, my name associated with them wouldn't be good. But if you have direct contact with bros, I'd be more than happy to provide any info I hear in the future to you so that it can be disseminated to them. Um, and it goes on from there. So that really, when we got these emails and then when we got this image, you can see this is April 2013. Um, and he said he went to the training session a year ago. So 2012 is when the training session was. So we started in 2010. 2012, there's a training session. We get these emails and then we get the picture of the training session to confirm that. So once I realized that we were being monitored, um, I started to investigate. I started, we went to city council. We asked the mayor. She said she didn't know anything. We asked the chief of police. We asked city council members. And we just started to try to find out what we could. I started to research surveillance and learned about stingrays. Then I learned about the you know, Houston Police Department using them. And I've just been researching since then. At the beginning of 2015, I filed open records requests for a number of Houston Police Departments searching for my name, the Houston Freethinkers, stingrays, cell site simulators, and other keywords. I received a response and was told that there was 11 responsive sets of documents, but the state or the uh, HPD wanted the state to allow them to deny all my requests and to keep that information private. The state agreed on all but one, and I was able to get that one set of documents. That one set of documents alone was 800 pages. So who knows what's in the other, you know, uh, 10 sets that I didn't get? And I'm trying to pursue that, and I need help. Uh, lawyers backing me. I'm trying to seek help from the ACLU and other organizations who want to support and lead the way on this. Um, and I filed those in February, and now I just got them back. And what they show is that the Houston Police Department has been monitoring the Houston Freethinkers since 2010, uh, even before we existed. And this, most of it is things that are posted online on social media, which you have come to expect, and you should ex expect that everything you put on the internet is being watched in some way, especially if you're an activist. The police are seen, and they, they are just keeping tabs on it. I have plenty of criminal intelligence division bulletins for every protest we've ever done, for every arrest we did, and also some information that was not released publicly. There's at least one piece of information that wasn't released publicly that tells me that there may have been some sort of intel uh, around the Occupy time. The Houston Freethinkers were involved with Occupy Houston, and we also launched Occupy the Fed Houston and I believe there was probably intelligence officer, an undercover informant officer working there uh, among us, someone among us. And beyond that, I have, you know, just basically showing that the city council in the city 
trying to get on the same page of how to discuss stingrays and that's all I have right now. I'm trying to get the redis to the documents I have and I f plan to file more open records requests to look into these newer tools like the Hailstorm and others and search for the DRT boxes and I hope to find out who's flying these planes. So that's what I'm working on now. Now let's move to solutions. Making smart decisions about surveillance, a guide for communities. You can find this from the ACLU of California. It looks at unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, automatic license plate readers, public audio recording devices such as spot shot or the gun recording devices, CCTV surveillance, facial recognition, automated social media monitoring, um, like the recently revealed Beware program, which analyzes social media and will assign you a threat score based on that. Now, what can you do? How can we empower ourselves to take action on this? Of course, knowledge is power, so that's why you guys are listening to this. You can educate your friends and family, share this video with them, share the articles, do your own research and share it with people closest to you. You can lobby city council and state legislature for limits on data collection and warrant requirements. Um, you know, those are definitely solutions on some hands, but I will say it's difficult to know if that's gonna have an effect if you pass a city council measure that says the police, the local police will use warrants when they get these um, devices. How are we to trust that they really will do that when they've operated without any oversight for so long? And not only that, but that doesn't stop the federal agencies involved in this. There are many other agencies beyond just local and state, so it, it's difficult to know how, how well protect, protected you really would be. Support technologies that counter the surveillance, IMSI catcher detectors. Uh, there are many people out there, developers, who are working on software and apps that could help you uh, either identify whenever you're being monitored by a stingray or eventually hopefully counteract it and block it block it in some way and that's what we're really working on there's also the crypto phone things like that that are more expensive and but can help you identify if you are being monitored by a stingray and lastly you can stop using a cell phone because as long as you use a cell phone then you can be found you know there's hard cases there's soft cases that you can buy which will protect your signal and and keep you from being uh, stingray but then you can't make phone calls you can't send out any texts or do anything so it's basically it's inoperable so if you're gonna do that you might as well just take out your battery rather than buying something and just take it out and use it put it back in whenever you want to use it and then take it back out again and lastly there is this app snoop snitch that I want to show you guys it's one of several and it's still in early development and I think it only works for Android but it's worth checking out and it can help you identify all the cell um, networks in the area, the, the, the towers. And if you identify those towers and then you end up finding that you have a tower that is mobile and moving around, then it's more than likely not a, a stationary uh, cell tower. It's probably somebody driving around monitoring you or monitoring other people. So that's, that's what I have. I think that we should invest our time and energy into tools that will empower us and help us combat this surveillance on all levels. Ultimately, it's not about fear. It's about educating yourself and empowering yourself. You have the information now. You know what level of surveillance exists. And now it's up for you to decide, what am I going to do about this? Thank you guys for listening.